Yes, how are you? Yeah, happy to see you here. Yeah, thank yeah, you so because much. You're very busy, you're very busy in, with your, your schedule and work in, in Europe. Yeah, well, I'm uh, very grateful to have uh, our session together. Yeah, thank you, thank you for your uh, joining this uh, forum. So, uh, so you are ready, and uh, all of the people here in Taiwan are ready too. So let's uh, get started Wonderful. Uh, with this uh, for, forum. Okay, uh, let me, um, so uh, dear uh, friends and, uh, and colleagues, I am Daiji Xiao uh, from the Institute of Economics at Academia Sinica. On behalf of two organizers of this forum, the Risk Society and Policy Research Center of National Taiwan University, and uh, advocacy of the United Daily News Group. We all have been profoundly honored to have Professor Jeffrey D. Sachs joining this one-hour forum on new turbulence in the world, new solutions for sustainability today. First, I wish to extend to Professor Sachs our most sincere welcome and the uh, so Prize Foundation for our profound thanks. The 2022 Time Prize in Sustainability Award was awarded to Professor Sachs for leading transdisciplinary sustainability science and creating the multi multilateral movements for its applications from village to nation and uh, the world. This is quoted from the Time Prize uh, Foundation. Since time is the most precious resource for this forum, I will not spend more time introducing Professor Sachs and the three panelists. The forum will start with a 15 minutes remark by Professor Sachs on the subject of this forum. That is when we are facing such new turbulences such as the Ukraine-Russia war or pandemics and epidemics, how to make international communities in general and Taiwan in particular cooperatively join global efforts to find innovative solutions for sustainable transformation. After his remarks, I will invite four panelists to join the discussion and invite media group members to ask a couple of questions. Without further ado, let us welcome Professor Sachs to give his remarks. Thank you. Professor Shah, thank you very much. And colleagues, it's, a, it's an enormous honor and pleasure for me to be together with you. And I'm so grateful uh, to the Tang Prize Selection Committee for this, this tremendous uh, honor that uh, it is uh, so, generously and kindly bestowed on me and a great chance for uh, deepening friendships and relationships uh, with the scholars uh, in Taiwan. So I'm, I'm most grateful. And I also thank you for the topic today, uh, which is how to proceed and overcome the uh, remarkable turbulence that uh, we are all facing in all parts of the world right now. I, I think it is correct to say that we have not had such a cascade of crises uh, as we are now going through in many, many decades. The world is uh, in a very dangerous situation right now uh, because of war, geopolitical tensions, rising environmental crises, and crises of governance uh, in many places in the world. I don't recall myself a, a period uh, of such high anxiety and disruption as we are currently experiencing. We obviously are in the midst of multiple 
uh, challenges and transformations. Even before the recent geopolitical crises and the uh, pandemic, even before 2020, that is, we had major global challenges to confront because the world society and interconnected world economy uh, was failing to cope with the growing environmental crises that were besetting the planet. And for that reason, the world's governments uh, already back in 2015 had adopted two core agreements on sustainable development goals and on the Paris Climate Agreement to try to orient the world towards a more sustainable future. We've known, in fact, for many decades, and I remind us that this is the 30th anniversary of the Rio Earth Summit, that we would be facing growing and growing environmental shocks because our global economic system was increasingly impinging on the physical environment. And this was occurring in at least three distinct ways. The most uh, dramatic and uh, deepest was the human-induced climate change. Uh, second was the massive degradation of land areas and marine areas because of overfishing, overharvesting, uh, over uh, uh, cutting of forest lands and so forth that was destroying biodiversity and threatening ecosystems. And the third major environmental crisis was the crisis of pollution of many sorts from industrial production, air pollution, water pollution, soil pollution, plastics pollution. So we already 30 years ago knew we were on a collision course, but we were not able as a global community to face this in a coherent way. And because of the increasing threats in 2015, those two major agreements that I mentioned were adopted. But what we have seen consistently is a failure of governments worldwide to work together despite our evident extraordinarily strong interconnections and interdependencies you know, that needed to, and the cooperation needed to face these challenges. Politics has remained very much local and national, even as the crises have become increasingly global and multilateralism was under already great strain for much of this period, but that strain has increased tremendously. Now, since 2020, the cascade of crises has intensified further, and I would say now dramatically. Uh, the COVID pandemic, was a uh, profound dislocation to the entire world economy and world society. And once again, though, this was uh, without question a global phenomenon with a uh, dangerous virus that easily spread across national boundaries. There was very little cooperation globally in confronting the pandemic. So we experienced a global interconnected crisis with almost no international cooperation or collaboration. And institutions like the World Health Organization proved to be very uh, weakened by the lack of cooperation among the major powers and especially by the extraordinary tensions between the United States and China. As a result of the lack of cooperation, most governments in the world were completely unable to cope 
with the pandemic. Taiwan was a significant exception because Taiwan, evidently from the first moments of the news of the outbreak in China, uh, responded with uh, a sense of uh, alarm and in a very uh, effective way, I might say. But most of the world lacked the experience, the know-how, the capacity, and the public trust to put in place any kind of effective protections. And in the United States, for example, we've had 1.2 million deaths from the pandemic since the start, and we never developed it during the entire time a coherent national policy other than vaccination, but no public health control of any effective sort, I would say, in the United States during the entire pandemic. And many other countries were in a similar or even worse condition. And then on top of all of this, this year, 2022, has been marked by unprecedented uh, shocks. Uh, not only did the pandemic continue, uh, but we have also experienced extraordinary environmental shocks all over the world that reflect the fact that those adverse tendencies, which I noted, have continued to intensify. And even today, uh, the United States is being hit by an extraordinary hurricane in Florida. Uh, it shows once again uh, our unpreparedness and our unseriousness in politics. The governor of the state of Florida appealing for emergency help is uh, absolutely useless in general uh, when it comes to taking preventative actions against climate because he is a, uh, a uh, climate opposer uh, until his state is uh, hit by disaster. But of course, we've also had the war in Ukraine, which was a uh, an avoidable conflict had the United States and Russia engaged in diplomacy. But for a number of reasons, which I'll mention briefly, uh, there was no diplomacy before the war. And now there is a full-fledged war that is escalating and is leading even in these days and hours to terrifying talk about the risk of nuclear war because the two powers, the United States and Russia, are on a collision course this year. And of course, this year we've had a significant worsening of relations between the United States and China. Uh, and Taiwan has uh, been an epicenter of <laughs> that escalating crisis. So I would say 2022 has uh, shown that uh, on all of our dimensions of crisis, uh, we are continuing on a path of increasing turbulence, weakening multilateralism, failures of basic diplomacy and cooperation. And in every area that we're confronting, we need most of all cooperation and diplomacy because none of the challenges that we are facing can be confronted by individual governments and countries alone. So we have the paradox of growing global disruption and weakening global cooperation at the same time. Of course, I spend uh, almost every waking hour, uh, day by day, trying to understand why we have such a great difficulty of achieving global cooperation right now. And for me, uh, if I might reflect, it has a lot to do with our changed uh, global geopolitical conditions. Uh, and maybe I will take us back uh, again uh, 50 years. Uh, 
when I was a student studying international relations, we read a powerful book by a U.S. economic historian, Charles Kindleberger, a, a book called The World in Depression, uh, which he wrote about the Great Depression of the 1930s, which was, uh, of course, also a period of uh, global collapse and devastating crisis that led to the full-scale uh, war, uh, World War II. And Kindleberger argued that in the 1930s, the biggest crisis was the crisis of cooperation. And he said, made an argument which I found very uh, interesting 50 years ago and very resonant today. He said that the challenge in the 1930s was that there was no global leader that could really effectively help to overcome the Great Depression because the global leader at the time, Great Britain, was uh, in decline and was sufficiently weakened by World War I that it could not play a global leadership role. And what would become the country of global leadership after World War II, the United States, <laughs> was not yet ready or willing or even self-aware in the 1930s that it had a global responsibility despite a worldwide depression. And so Kindleberger argued that it was the lack of leadership in the 1930s which deepened the crisis so fundamentally and meant that the Great Depression was never solved and which uh, because of that uh, opened up the uh, space for uh, fascism uh, in Europe and in Asia and the, the war that followed. Well, I think that what is notable about Kindleberger's analysis, why it resonates with me today, is we are clearly in a geopolitical transition, but we don't have structures to address it and we don't have diplomacy to address it either. The most fundamental change geopolitically of the last uh, 30 years, of course, is the rise of mainland China in its power, in its economy, in its technology. And this has meant that the United States uh, self-image as the unipo unipolar sole superpower is no longer the case. We're in a transition from uh, a US dominated world to a multipolar world, but we are not in a transition yet to a new diplomacy that is consistent with that changing world. I can say perhaps speaking bluntly uh, about the U.S. situation, the U.S. Uh, political leaders and U.S. state continue to believe uh, that the U.S. Uh, should dominate the world and aims to continue that posture. But that runs up against uh, the reality that the U.S. economic and technological situation and internal state of affairs is no longer consistent with a, a unipolar world. The reality of the world is a multipolar world. In fact, East Asia is really more the center of gravity of the world economy, not North America. And to my mind, that is the result of economic success of development in Taiwan, in Korea, in uh, mainland China, in uh, the entire East Asian region. And that's a wonderful thing, in my opinion. But it means that the world that we knew geopolitically uh, of a US uh, unipolar world no longer applies. I believe in what I work towards uh, in my 
intellectual work and in my practical work with the United Nations and in my work specifically for sustainable development is helping to forge a truly multipolar world in which each region of the world has its voice and has its say, but in which each region cooperates internally within the region to address critical issues such as energy transformation, which tends to be a regional issue, or biodiversity conservation and climate adaptation, which tend to be regional issues, and that the regions cooperate amongst each other so that we can have peace and a global cooperative environment to address the underlying challenges of environment and economic inequality and persistence of poverty and challenges of migration and other economic issues. So I believe that we need to forge a multipolar geopolitical framework, one that is based on cooperation rather than on confrontation. But we are not succeeding in that. We are uh, in a path of growing confrontation. The US uh, policymakers aim, in my understanding, to try to preserve America's dominance. But I think that that's the wrong goal. Uh, I think the goal should be America's uh, partnership and cooperation with other regions rather than dominance. I see that attempt at dominance in both the crisis in East Asia and the crisis in Ukraine. In the context of Ukraine, in my opinion, which is not a very popular opinion in the United States, I can tell you, but it is my understanding of a situation in a region that I know very well from 30 years of close experience, it is, uh, it, it has been the US unwillingness to regard Russia as a uh, respected counterpart that is at the root of this crisis. Because the United States, despite Russian opposition, has been expanding the NATO military alliance relentlessly for 30 years, even though the Russian counterparts have repeatedly said, please do not move your military up to our border. It's extremely dangerous for us. It diminishes our national security. And yet the United States has pushed NATO into the uh, Russian neighborhood without uh, regard for Russia's, uh, I think, legitimate uh, concerns. And that included pushing NATO into Ukraine and into Georgia in the Black Sea region, which would have surround or which would surround Russia uh, and its naval power in the Black Sea. And that, to my mind, is the underlying root of this war that we are experiencing. In East Asia, in my interpretation, the United States policymakers about eight years ago came to the view that the US should take steps to diminish the economic advance of mainland China by cutting off access to markets and technology. And this uh, attempt at containing the rise of mainland China uh, has intensified in the last couple of years with the, and Taiwan is completely at the center of this uh, crisis, uh, is the attempt by the United States to stop access of mainland China to advanced semiconductors. I don't think policies like this really work in the long term. Uh, because mainland China will develop capacities for uh, small nanometer uh, microcircuitry uh, under the pressures of this kind of uh, export 
restraint, but it does raise the geopolitical tensions dramatically. And I believe that this is a part of what is occurring right now. So just to summarize, we have global problems that are extraordinarily complex and challenging. Uh, even in the best of worlds, making a transformation from a fossil fuel based economy to a zero carbon economy in time to protect us from devastating climate change would be a phenomenal uh, accomplishment of humanity. But it would require a degree of cooperation on many fronts, technological, policy, trade, investment, and finance that would be unprecedented in the extent of cooperation. But we are clearly <laughs> failing to achieve that cooperation. And in fact, just to conclude, the cooperation is diminishing, not rising alongside the need. And the failure of cooperation, in my opinion, is a failure of great power politics because ultimately the multilateral system depends to an extraordinary extent, not on the 193 members of the United Nations, though I would like to think that, but on the uh, interactions of five or six or seven major countries, the United States, Russia, China, uh, the EU, uh, India, and a handful of others, and the capacity of these very large <coughs> and powerful and nuclear states to cooperate with each other for more fundamental purposes. And that is failing right now. And I can say in the United States context, the mood in the political circles is not for cooperation. It is for confrontation, uh, and that confrontation is put in a variety of ways, but whichever way it's described, it undermines the case for a cooperative approach to the global challenges. So in the end, we have many major uh, complexities, technological, demographic, uh, economic, and financial. But fundamentally to all of them is the role of government and the role of cooperation among governments. And in my experience now advising the United Nations for the past 22 years, while I see challenges everywhere, the biggest challenge that I see each day is the lack of cooperation and diplomacy among the major powers. So let me pause there because I know we have a, a wonderful discussion ahead and turn it back over to you, Professor Shah. Yeah, thank you, Professor Sachs, for your uh, very uh, deep yeah, analysis of the, 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 the reasons for this uh, uh, a lot of uh, global challenges we are facing, and uh, you, you believe that the uh, the cooperation, lack of cooperation, is the key, is the key. And uh, uh, so now the the problem is how to uh, how to make uh, people and the countries cooperate. That's the that's the key in the world uh, system, in the world political geopolitical system. So uh, let's. Um, Proceed to the next uh, uh, section of this uh, forum, that's a panel discussion. I'd like to invite, uh, there are four uh, panelists, and uh, I will invite two uh, to say, to, to, to speak, uh, to uh, elaborate their comments uh, first, and then, uh, then it will follow by Professor Sachs' uh, uh, response or, or and then uh, I will invite the other two uh, to, to
to to speak and then uh, and then uh, uh, Professor Sachs uh, responses. And following that, and we will if we have still have time, then we will invite two uh, media's uh, to uh, present their questions. So Professor uh, Xu uh, Huang Xiong Xu first. Uh, uh, Professor Xu is a distinguished research fellow at the Research Center for Environmental Changes in Academia Sinica. Professor Xu, please. Uh, hello, Dr. Sachs. Thank you for a very inspiring talk, especially about the geopolitical uh, cooperation. Uh, I have the uh, following your speech. I have the following questions. Uh, the first one is, to achieve the net zero by 2050 target, commitment needs to be fulfilled, especially uh, geopolitically uh, uh, cooperation. Development and implementation of new technologies need to be scaled up and sped up. How confident that you think the COP meetings in terms of geopolitical cooperation can help us to achieve this goal? And, and the, the second one is with the issues of a green climate fund, especially the argument about loss and damage. I think that's also a part of a big issue in ge geopolitical uh, cooperation too. Would that hinder the progress in COP27? Thank you. Okay, and next I'd like to invite uh, Dr. Uh, Gloria Xu. Uh, she is a uh, managing director of uh, geo, uh, NGO in Taiwan as Moms Loves Taiwan Association. Professor, uh, Dr. Xu, please. Thank you, uh, Professor Sachs, for your inspiring uh, speech. Uh, I have two questions for you. The first one is, in light of the recent heat waves around global, after nearly three decades of UN negotiations, incremental changes obvious do not meet the climate urgency. Do you envision the world with some kind of shock policies, even countries start collaborations? How to avoid the coming climate disasters? The mighty and wealthy countries are not, are the main culprits to climate change crisis are not willing to take responsibility yet. In so far, not enough financial support is provided for GCF, not to mention the funding for loss and the damage, any measures to circumvent the conundrum. <laughs> My second question is, many policymakers stress the importance of efficiency in decision-making as most under budget constraints. To alleviate urgent climate change problems, many techniques are promoted, such as energy efficiency improvement, solar PV, wind and geothermal, carbon capture and storage, small modular reactors and solar radiation management. Some technologies are cheap, mature, and relatively harmless toward environment, while some are expensive under development or on papers only, and may bring disastrous outcome. Do you think we should treat these technologies equally, or we should rank them based on their cost effectiveness, or leave it to the invisible hand? Thank you. Yeah, Professor Sachs, and that's your turn. Thank you. Uh, thank you for these uh, wonderful questions, and uh, both uh, quite closely related to the challenge of the energy transformation. And let me just briefly describe the challenge uh, and then uh, describe the obstacles and then uh, try to describe some solutions. Of course, the core challenge is that the uh, greenhouse emissions and specifically the carbon dioxide and methane emissions from our fossil fuel-based energy system uh, have uh, already warmed the planet on average by 1.2 degrees Celsius. And the energy imbalance currently is leading to a continued rate of warming of more than 0.3 degrees Celsius per decade. So we are 
going to exceed the 1.5 degrees Celsius limit within 10 years, most likely. And in fact, we could reach 1.5 degrees even within the next few years in a bad El Nino year because of the El Nino effect of warming. What my colleague James Hansen, one of the world's great climate scientists, points out is that we are already setting record warming even during a La Nina phase of the Pacific, which usually cools the planet. So even while we are in a cooling phase, we are still setting record heat temperatures. And he points out that's because the fundamental energy imbalance from the greenhouse effect continues to worsen. And so we therefore understand that staying below the 1.5 degrees Celsius limit is extraordinarily difficult. We probably will overshoot the 1.5 degrees limit we risk runaway climate change from the feedback effects of the continued warming. In other words, uh, as the climate scientists describe it, we are reaching tipping points in major uh, parts of the world in melting of the permafrost, in changing the ocean circulation patterns, in drying of the rainforest regions, such that a bit more warming could lead to a runaway phase of climate. And all of this means that the damages and disasters that are being incurred in 2022 will set records, massive storms, massive flooding, massive droughts, massive forest fires everywhere in the richest countries as well as the poorest. Uh, this will all intensify. At the core of the transformation is to move to a net zero energy system. We've known this for decades, but uh, the pace has been extraordinarily slow or not even uh, in the right direction up until now. Uh, one piece of important good news is that during the past 30 years, the cost of zero carbon solutions, especially photovoltaics and wind power, and storage of uh, intermittent energy has come down tremendously so that the affordability of the transformation has been uh, greatly enhanced. But the action for the transformation continues to be slow or even non-existent. Now, this raises the questions again, why? What's wrong with the governance? One part of the resistance is that the incumbent oil and gas and coal producing countries have resisted the change. Ten countries roughly account for 80 to 90 percent of all the fossil fuel production in the world. So it's only a handful of countries, uh, the United States, uh, China, India, uh, the Gulf countries, Russia, and just a few others that make almost all the difference because most of the rest of the world is a user of the fossil fuels produced elsewhere. So it's a group of the major countries that has been the most uh, failed. Now, why is this? Well, uh, in the United States, I can tell you it's because our political system has still been dominated by the fossil fuel interests up until basically today. Uh, we still have too much power held by ExxonMobil uh, or by other major oil companies and too much political power uh, by even the coal industry, to make a decisive transformation. And in other parts of the world, it's even more dramatic. Russia is a, is a petro-state. The Gulf region is a petro-state. Uh, in China, uh, coal 
still plays a major role in employment and in politics. So that's one issue. Uh, a second issue is that the technological transformation is complex and the underlying technologies were not very good 20 years ago. They are much better today, but they're still compli complicated, excuse me. Uh, and that means that making this transformation is not easy. Also, this transformation is very land intensive. To You need a lot of land for major solar and wind power, except with the possibility of offshore wind power, which has uh, become more cost effective in recent years. For a uh, highly densely populated uh, place like Taiwan, there isn't a lot of uh, land for that energy transformation. And land use is also highly political. Even the public doesn't like transmission lines. So simply saying we will put uh, solar power in the deserts and then use transmission lines to bring it to the cities turns out to be very politically uh, charged and complicated. Uh, and uh, postponed for many, many years. So there's a lot of inertia in the fossil fuel-based energy system. Then uh, comes the uh, fact that real transformation should be done on a regional basis. I'll take the United States as a quick example. We need hydropower from Canada and solar power from Mexico. And yet we discuss the transformation only on national level. And in the case of Taiwan and East Asia, it's quite clear that East Asia actually needs an integrated strategy. And if there were a high level of trust between the mainland and Taiwan, for example, one part of the energy transition, in my view, would be an undersea cable connecting the power grids of Taiwan and the mainland China and China with Mongolia, with Southeast Asia, and so forth. In other words, there would be a regional grid. But there's so little trust in the region that the idea absolutely seems impossible, fanciful, even though it would be the low cost solution. And so all of our problems are beset by politics and by complexity. Now, what are the solutions? In terms of the complexity, we need long-term planning to play a greater role because governments that operate on a short-term political cycle are unable to address this crisis. And when governments are only operating election to election, it's impossible to address energy transformation in a deep way. So the first thing I recommend is a pathway analysis that is detailed and quantitative and that extends at least to the year 2050. This is not how we operate. Government set short-term plans. Taiwan has a plan for increasing renewable energy up to 2025, for example, and it's behind on its targets, but it does not have a coherent strategy up to 2050. But we can't even make short-term actions without long-term planning. And so I, I believe in the need for long-term planning as absolutely essential. I would be very pleased if governments in Taiwan, in mainland China, in the United States were able to say more coherently in 2050, this is what our energy system will look like. But very few governments have the capacity right now to make any kind of meaningful projection up to mid-century. Of course, in the spirit of my earlier comments, I believe that regional cooperation is crucial 
and measures to overcome distrust are extraordinarily important. But again, we're not on that direction. Trust has collapsed in the past six months uh, between the mainland and Taiwan, for example, or between China and the United States. We've had a, we're in a massive crisis of distrust, not of trust building. And so this is a, another uh, significant barrier. And then when it comes to the international negotiations, I think that there is uh, there, there are many deep problems, but one is the unwillingness of the rich world really to bear any responsibility for the poor world. I, I know because I come from a country where politics is very selfish, American congressmen have no interest whatsoever in helping poor countries, none. And they regard votes of money for poor countries as absolutely uh, useless for their reelections. And so when poor countries appeal for losses and damages support, because they say the rich country, they say correctly that the rich countries uh, made this disaster and they should help to pay for its remediation. Uh, the United States has no domestic discussion whatsoever, neither political party, no vote in Congress, no draft legislation, no proposal by the Biden ad administration for any kind of meaningful losses and damages support other than a tiny trickle of money. And that is a serious problem. It is basically as is true on many different areas of politics, uh, rich countries say, don't remind us of the past. Uh, we're not going to take responsibility for anything in the past. And you're on your own. And this is a message that is dividing the world quite sharply. Last week at the UN General Assembly, uh, many poor countries spoke out quite bitterly about the lack of solidarity and the lack of meaningful support for the growing crises that these countries are facing. So all in all, uh, we can see, I believe we can see what a just solution would be, but we are still far from that in political terms. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Professor Sachs, for your very uh, clear uh, response to our to the questions and I will uh, Professor Zhou and I will ask uh, uh, our questions and then uh, uh, you will uh, give us another response but um, okay I will present my question first uh, according to recent annual sustainable development reports co-authored by Professor Sachs and others the world has not made much progress on the SDGs in recent years, and especially no progress in the last two years. Among 17 SDGs, uh, the performances of, of SDG 12, 13, 14, and 15 has been mostly stagnant or insufficient. Uh, it may be due to the turbulences. You have uh, just elaborate uh, in the in in your uh, talk, and however, I think uh, it may be due to the very nature of international and uh, intergenerational externalities and the public goods that coexisted in the effort to meet these SDGs. Because of those uh, this uh, very nature, uh, many countries may prefer to enjoy the free lunch instead of go ahead to work. How to solve this problem? That's my, uh, my, my, my question. <laughs> That's uh, actually, you have uh, provided many, uh, several uh, clear solutions to solve this problem, but uh, uh, I think we still need to have some innovative approach, such as uh, a climate club, and uh, that's a very interesting uh, approach. Uh, yeah. By the way, I'd like to let you know that our government and uh, an academia sinica has uh, worked on and actually has uh, 
pronounced our uh, pathway and the strategy told 2050 net zero. Yeah. Bravo. Early this year. Early this year. Uh, and that's, uh, that's uh, we have this one. And so uh, a lot of um, efforts uh, from different ministries and academics and, uh, and, uh, and the com local communities, local uh, governments are working on this. Thank you. Yeah, you're, yeah, uh, Professor Zhou, please. Okay, uh, thank you, moderator Professor Xiao. Yeah, as host of this forum, uh, I would like to express my sincere gratitude to the uh, CEO of the Town Price Foundation, Professor Chen Zhenchuan, and uh, Professor Jeffrey Sachs for your kind generous acceptance of helping organizing and uh, attending this forum. My question is relatively simple. That, that Taiwan as the uh, world's uh, 21st largest uh, economic countries uh, has emitted uh, about 257 million tons of GHG and, and uh, ranked uh, 22nd uh, and uh, also contribute about 0.8% uh, of the global uh, total GHG emission. Uh, but to the per capita, Taiwanese actually emit more than the other country citizen. That is to say that Taiwan is actually a high carbon manufacturer countries compared to the other uh, East Asian countries such as South Korea, Japan and China. On the other hand, we know that Taiwan uh, played a very important role of the global supply chains. Uh, particularly the, the, of the semiconductor industry and the electronical industry. I would like, would like to uh, hear that uh, what is uh, Professor Sachs' uh, perspective that Taiwan as the world's middle largest economic uh, countries, but not one of the members of the United Nations. How can Taiwan use its uh, very special status quo internationally to contribute the world? We know actually it's, uh, Taiwanese have the full will and the obligation to contribute to the global sustainability to actually to contribute to the next generation. And by our uh, the characteristic of the uh, vibrant democratic uh, society, uh, uh, yeah, society bodies, we actually uh, uh, try to stretch for any kinds of the innovative uh, effort. Yeah to the world, but you know, we actually also meet the uh, strong confrontation as you yeah, mentioned uh, yeah, by the two or major power yeah, uh, yeah, countries and uh, how can Taiwan actually use its uh, very uh, unique autonomy uh, to help the world and also that uh, uh, can, can construct the, the, the meaning of the cosmopolitan governments, even Taiwan is not a member of the United Nations. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Sachs. Now, maybe you, you can limit your, your response in six to 10 minutes. Yeah. Okay, very good. Thank you for uh, two easy questions uh, uh, and uh, two extraordinarily uh, important questions. We, we need to deploy institutions that are consistent with the challenges. And in the case of the international and intergenerational externalities, I believe that the multilateral institutions, especially the multilateral development banks, could play a far larger role than they do. They take the finance issue outside of national politics and put it into a more global and a more intergenerational context. So I have always been uh, in favor of a much larger role of uh, banks like the Asian Development Bank or the new Asia Infrastructure Investment Bank, AIIB, that China uh, created, or uh, similar institutions around the world. And in my work, uh, at the UN right now, I'm propounding a plan to increase by a factor of five to 10, the scale of financing through such public institutions, but multilateral institutions, because I think that they could help to rechannel 
the flows of finance and take them out of the national political tracks into a more uh, global and intergenerational track. So that's a very quick uh, response. But we need institutional means that are commensurate with the nature of the public goods that we need to we need to finance. When it comes to uh, you know the specific challenges of Taiwan, these are of course uh, extraordinarily important and uh, and complex. Uh, and uh, it uh, would be reckless of me to say. Uh, anything within, uh, you know, a, a couple of minutes uh, that uh, would deny the complexity of the issues that we face. But I, I will say, if I may, uh, and forgive me for great oversimplification, I do believe two things truly are important. One is a tremendous reduction of the tensions between the United States and the PRC. I think that this is vital for the world. I do not believe that uh, China is the enemy of the United States, and I don't believe that there is any sense in which that is an inevitability. And I know how little my fellow Americans, and I'm talking about the political leaders, understand also the real history of China and the challenges and the complexities and and so forth. So my own view is that we could achieve much lower tensions between the United States and China. I can't imagine anything more positive for Taiwan than reducing the tensions between the United States and China. And the second, and I again apologize for oversimplification, but reducing the tensions across the straits uh, between Taiwan and the mainland, I believe is extremely important. I have one basic principle, again, a big oversimplification, but I believe that dialogue is crucial in this world. So I think we need institutionalized ways of ongoing discussion between countries, between governments, uh, because to my opinion, uh, dialogue is the basis for cooperation. I was very unhappy when the Biden administration said that it would stop the strategic dialogue with China because it said, well, we can't really negotiate, we can't trust the mainland and so forth. This to my mind is not the right approach. The right approach is a strategic dialogue, even a bureaucratically built dialogue that systematically talks together. Because in my understanding of politics and geopolitics and human life, two-way discussion is the single most important way to break down tensions and barriers and to find the win-win approaches or the, uh, the positive sum approaches. So I don't believe that uh, unilateral pressures or insistence can solve problems. And taking sides that exacerbate the divisions can solve the problems. And I, uh, I, I can only tell you I could watch this crisis in Ukraine building over the past 20 years, I was actually an advisor to the first president of independent Ukraine in 1993-94, President Kuchma. I've been there since the beginning, and I've watched how the U.S.-Russia tensions caught Ukraine in the middle. And that's the tragedy. And Ukraine would swing. You have to be on our side. You have to be on our side. But with the two big powers in rising tension, it was impossible for Taiwan to find, uh, I'm sorry, for Ukraine to find a path of safety. And I think reducing the tensions among the major powers is the single most important step. And I hope that it will be a, an objective uh, of the two governments 
uh, in a very conscious way, because I think that this would go far to addressing these challenges. Even on the mainland's interpretation of the two China policy, in my view, there is so much room for Taiwan's contribution to the world, which is enormous, always has been enormous, and will continue to be enormous. But that role, in my view, will come into the full fruition with reduced tensions between the major powers, because then Taiwan can play such a magnificent role in so many areas. But I believe that key to this is uh, finding a diplomatic uh, approach that that reduces what have become this year very, very uh, difficult and uh, very dangerous conditions. So maybe I will stop there. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Yeah, that's a very, uh, the, the two recommendations or policy recommendations are very important. Actually, in Taiwan, uh, this is uh, highly or hardly debated in Taiwan. Yeah, to reduce the tension between Taiwan and China or to intensify this tension. Yeah, that's uh, hardly debated here. And it's a very political, it's very political yeah, issue. Yeah. And so uh, thank you. And uh, since time is uh, up, but we still have uh, uh, two, uh, sorry, uh, two media persons they like to ask uh, a couple of questions. Are you available for the next, uh, say, 10 minutes? Yeah, maybe five minutes if we, I'll be short if we could, uh, I, because I'm actually expected to speak uh, down the block. So I, I really have to run. Okay, okay. So uh, let me invite, um, Sorry, go check out. Uh, Ms. Liu from Advocacy of the United Danish Youth Group. Yeah. Uh, hi, uh, Professor Sachs. Thanks for your speech. It's very inspiring. 那肖老师，我接下来就是一个简单的问题，我想时间很棒。OK， 那因为刚才那个 Sachs 教授提到比较多是地缘政治的因素，那我蛮好奇说，在这个就是明年的或者是下阶段永续目标的推进里头。有没有哪些的不确定因素可能会是导致这个推进过程不顺畅？就是这个问题。好，谢谢。Okay. Uh, yeah. Her question. Yeah, I like to uh translate uh for her. It's a uh, what is the most uh significant global risk considered high impact and high likelihood uh for the global effort to enhance uh sustainability, especially. Will uh, have uh, it's a uh, very uncertain, uncertain to uh, to meet uh, this. Uh, that's a high because it's a high uh, likelihood. Yeah, or or and um, make the sustainability uh, much uh, uncertain. Thank you. Okay, then uh, let me invite the other one. That's uh, Miss Xie from uh, the Storm Media. Yeah, please. Hello, uh, Professor Zax. Uh, I have very few questions. How worse, in your observation, how worse could European energy crisis be in the winter? And what lesson can Taiwan learn from European energy crisis? Thank you. Yeah, th thank you very much. Uh, let me start with the second question. The European energy crisis is a result of the war uh, in Ukraine. And the uh, best way to end the European energy crisis is to negotiate an end of the war. And I believe for a variety of reasons that I've been writing about that the war could end in negotiation in short order, but it would involve politically uh, a neutral Ukraine that is not a member of NATO uh, as a, a safe zone in between uh, the United States alliance and Russia. Uh, but this is what the U.S. has not accepted, and therefore there has not been a negotiation feasible. But the European energy crisis is a crisis from the war itself. And if the war ended, then the energy crisis would diminish considerably. Uh, so 
on the first question of uh, what are the main steps that could be taken to overcome this uh, crisis, uh, I've elaborated some of them in my remarks, but the one that the two things that are most needed by every country or the three things that are most needed by every country in the world are a plan of action or a pathway, access to technology and access to finance. It's that package to know what to do, to have the ability to either purchase or develop the technologies and to have the financing to implement this. And on the financing, as I've explained, I am myself trying to promote much larger public financing through multilateral institutions, especially the multilateral development banks. And when it comes to uh, the plans, I recommend exactly what uh, I'm so happy to hear Academica Sinica has done, and I'm eager to read the plan to make a path to 2050. This is what I recommend that every country should do. When it comes to technology, this is where Taiwan, of course, shines as one of the great world leaders. This is a global market for Taiwan, uh, zero carbon energy systems. Uh, of course, it should be implemented within Taiwan, but it becomes a complete global need and global market smart grids, use of digital technologies, artificial intelligence systems, zero carbon uh, energy sources and uses. And this is an area where Taiwan can play an enormous role uh, in technological contribution because it's a technological powerhouse. Indeed, if I may say, if the uh, all of Northeast Asia region would cooperate, Japan, Korea, Taiwan, the mainland, together, I can tell you that would be the powerhouse of the world in technological solutions. So I think that this would be a remarkable contribution for the whole world. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Professor Sachs. So it's uh, very well, it's very great to have you here uh, to uh, give your remarks and then uh, to answer those uh, uh, questions presented by, by panelists and the media. And uh, yeah, it, it is uh, very important for us uh, to work together, especially regional uh, cooperation. And actually, many people in the in in, the, in Asia are t are talking about uh, regional or Asia East Asia Climate Club, yeah, or Climate uh, Federation. That kind of uh, uh, idea has been uh, discussed in, in this region. But um, because of the political tension between uh, countries or on um, uh, on faith and no, no trust, no trust between countries or governments, that's a, that's a big challenge. Yeah. So uh, it's uh, it's time uh, now. It uh, it's uh, ten minutes after the original schedule. I believe uh, Professor Sachs is uh, very busy and uh, will run to another uh, occasion. So thank you, Professor uh, Sachs, and uh, I hope you have uh, enjoyed your, your, your stay in, in Europe. Yeah. Thank you so much to all of you, and I hope uh, we can meet uh, in person, face to face uh, in, yes. in Taiwan in the coming year. Yeah. Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. We, we, we hope to see you next thank year you. in Taiwan. Okay, thank you. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.